So Brandon will lead us today in chapter two. So floor is yours. Okay, so for the folks who are here, your tour guide to the tidyverse for chapter two. All right, let's share some screen. We'll get rid of Slack. So, um, you know, as other folks have started with this, uh, with this particular thing, this is kind of just the, the outline for the chapter. Uh, rather than read it, we'll just dive in. We're going to go through each one of these stages uh, or each one of these uh, uh, components as we, as we get through this uh, today. So like the, the, the tidyverse has these four basic design principles that I think Hadley and uh, the folks at our studio that have really tried to, to amplify this through all of the packages that they've done, not just the tidyverse. Uh, it's about, uh, it's always been about usability. So like, you know, I, I started learning R in 2009 um, and the dplyr didn't exist and a bunch of other stuff didn't exist. Uh, the pipe didn't exist and so on and so forth. And, and uh, I can tell you, it's way better now, <laughs> way better now in terms of being able to like just uh, uh, dive into and dissect data and get to uh, that first plot. It's so much simpler, so much easier than it used to be. Um, and I think that's because they, they took the time to really, uh, to really, you know, not only, and we'll, we'll look at a, a, a figure in a second, but it's about having empathy for your users and being able to say, how are people going to use this? Name, giving things the, the right name so that like, you know what something does, you know what a function does. Like that's just, it's, it's almost, it's not always obvious what something does, but it's pretty close to obvious. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through some of the functions later. Um, you know, the consistency in the way things operate. So most of the tidyverse functions, I, I wanna say all, but I, I'm not gonna say all because I don't really know that. Uh, the, the first argument is the data, what you're going to feed in. And that's, that's, that's so it works better with the pipes uh, in, in many cases, but also uh, the, the, the argument structure is very consistent from, from function to function. Um, and, and kind of, I hinted at it earlier in terms of uh, when I was talking about human-centered, human uh, these things are very composable. So you're, you know, when you look at a pipe, you, you can almost read it. You're saying, I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna do this. It's very easy to put those pieces together in different, different ways and different orders and get the output that you need in order to progress your, uh, your research. Um, and I would say, just like just like uh, just like this group, um, um, you know, in general, the R Studio group and and the developers of Tidyverse have been very inclusive, uh, trying to bring as many different voices and and perspectives into the development process, and and that kind of goes towards the the empathy that you see in the human centered aspects, so that the functions do what you expect. So we'll get into that. Um, is this should I? Should I just make this full screen? Is that? Yeah, maybe for now. And I'll like blow it up. <laughs> if you're squinting on your phone, yeah. Um, so that, you know, the whole principle is that, you know, this is designed for humans. Um, we really want, they, they really wanted to like uh, make it as, uh, you know, we talked about it last time, the pit of success. I really love that analogy where it's like, you're you're going to fall into this solution. It's so easy to to implement that you'll be able to to work through your problem as as easily as possible. So it has to do with the way that they they develop their tool sets, um, and it all goes back to empathy. So you go through at major stages and make sure that usability is there from the beginning. And I will say that in many cases, like. Um, I, I follow, I try to follow the same process. Like, you know, you write a prototype, you get something that works, and then you go back and you make sure the variable names me are meaningful. For example, like this, this variable stores this data. And I know what that data is along, along the, like say within a function call or within a pipeline. Um, and, and then also, you know, you write it so that it's more readable in terms of, uh, so, so, so instead of having, we'll talk about this too, is instead of having, 
you can write these uh, dplyr functions as like, um, you know, within each other. And so you can have this really long function call or you can put them in a pipe. So it's really, really easy to read. So it's all about, you know, going back and making sure that uh, that, that these functions are written in a way and, and, and a, in a good way that, that we're able to use them uh, as, as intended. Um, I didn't watch this entire video this morning, but I, I got the gist of it within the first few minutes. The guy's trying to 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 push a door. I've done it a million times, um, and uh, or, or pull a door and it's push. And and so this one's actually labeled, but it has a handle to indicate that it's um, um, uh, it's it's pull. But I think it's like uh, something around. I did watch some of it here. So this is the definition of a Norman door. A door where the design tells you to do the opposite of what you're actually supposed to do, or that gives uh, the wrong signal and you need some sort of signal to correct it. So you pull the door and it doesn't do anything. It's, it might be locked, but you might want to try pushing it instead. Um, they want to, you know, they design these functions so that those, those, it's clear what you what you put in, it's clear what you get out, um, and you know, you don't have to think about it too hard. That's really what it comes down to. By the way, if I talk too fast or you have questions, uh, you can put them in the chat or and I'll try and respond and, and maybe somebody could call out if there is a question. If you have some input, because obviously you all are not, you know, maybe this is all everything you've heard before already, uh, have a perspective or a story to throw in, please, please just stop me and, and inject. So, uh, you know, the tidyverse is a series of packages. Obviously, it's um, it's uh, what is it? Dplyr, uh, Tibble. There's a, actually there's a bunch of them. Um, there, I I forget actually what gets all gets loaded. It's quite large now, which can be troublesome in some cases. Uh, like when you create a Docker image with all these things in it, it's uh, pretty large. Um, but obviously, uh, if it works and it's easy to just use, just go ahead and use it. <laughs> you can rewrite stuff. So uh, they always like to they always like to start with a pretty simple data set, empty cars, which is actually in base R. Uh, you can use it w without loading any packages. Um, it is about uh, um, data collected from a series of cars that were measured for many different uh, many different aspects uh, in the years 1973 to 1974. Um, so, so you can see the miles per gallon, the cylinders that it has, the displacement, the horsepower. I forget what some of these other ones are. Um, number of number of gears, the, the number of carbs, and so on and so forth. Um, and and then they're suggesting you know to use the the arrange function um, in in dplyr. So you you know as I said earlier, the first argument generally is always the the data input so here they're using a range um the the data is actually called dot data um and i believe this is because uh a lot of functions use uh df or data and stuff like that and they wanted to make sure that they could pass some of those other things through uh through the pipeline i believe so like uh dot data is very uncommon in other words. And so they use dot x dot data dot id dot many, 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 many uh, of the variables or, or the inputs uh, to these functions are called dot something. Um, as is done here, I always, I, I generally like to be explicit with what I'm assigning something within a function. So I, I generally will write out these things uh, but when I have a series of pipes, I often get lazy and just uh, the, the assumption in a pipe is always that the first argument is the previous input from the pipe above. Um, and I will get lazy and not put that in, not be explicit. But here we're arranging uh, empty cars by gear and then we're doing it by miles per gallon. Um, and I did, I, did, I did pump that out earlier. Um, Let me make that even bigger. I ran some code earlier. By the way, I'm so old school, I can't use our studio. 
<laughs> so I use the I use the I use the GUI actually. So I'm I I'm I'm trying to learn more. I, I find it too it's too cluttery for my for me. Um, but anyway, um, so so here here we we've, we've arranged that uh, this is empty cars itself, and then here we've arranged it with the arrange call that that was mentioned in the in the in the web page. Um, so you can see the Fleetwood is has the highest uh, number of gears, I believe, and miles per gallon, something like that. So it's three, and so on. Um, and get back to so here we're full screen. Uh, so, so the next thing is like uh, about reusing existing data structures. Um, you know, there there are many different types of like complex data structures in R. They list three of the main ones here: uh, matrices, lists, and data frames. Data frames are just are are simply lists that are special in some ways. And and the tidyverse likes to use uh, tibbles, um, which are in fact, kind of, I guess, opinionated data frames in some way. Well, I'll get into what that means in a little bit. But um, eff effectively, what we're what we're really after in terms of our data structure in general is, um, you know, different types of data are in a column, and then um, and then we have um, across rows we have an observation of some sort. Um, the, the one key thing that is really important for tidy models in particular, at least as far as I've looked through the book, um, and, and as far as I've used as well in my own, in my own research is that the tidy, the tibbles are, are easy, easy to use uh, list columns where, wherein you can have a column that stores very complicated objects um, like tibbles themselves. So you can have tibbles within tibbles with tibbles. It's like turtles all the way down. So the idea here is that we can have, um, uh, so we're using the, the R sample package to take empty cars and do a bootstrap sample of that empty cars data set three times. Um, and then when we pull that out, it, it looks like this. We have, um, we have a split of the data um, and we have the ID of that split and we can pull out those, those splits. Um, Actually, I can do that. Um, what was the object called? Boot samp. Oh, maybe I didn't run it. Oh, it's, I, it's underscore. underscore. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can pull out uh, from boot samp. You're going to find out how well I can type here as well today. Uh, you can see that you now these are list objects, so you can pull out these these lists these these particular lists. Um, I thought they were tibbles actually, but they're not. Anyway, you can you can use that's the idea is that you can store really complicated objects within rows, so that you know that those rows, that row of data is associated with the uh, with that particular uh, you know model or whatever object is associated with that particular data so if you it, so later you know we'll talk about nesting what i usually do is i nest data nesting is uh is a is a tidy r i think it's a tidy r uh function and what it does is you can say well i want to nest those those car models that have eight cylinders and then i want to take those data and i want to apply miles per gallon to displacement or something like that and so you can say that um and then you can run that model on on I forget what I said now eight gears or something like that or no eight cylinders you can run the same model on six cylinders and so on and so forth. So you take that data and then you can run a model like a linear model between those two things. So it stores all that together, and then you can say, well, what's the relationship if the if the um, if the the I'm forgetting what it is again. Eight, eight cylinders, what's the relationship it's, if it's six cylinders? What's the relationship if it's four cylinders and so on and so forth? Um, it's a really convenient way to do it. Let's see, there's a question. Nest and unnest. Yes, thank you, Frederica. Um, the reference there for nest and unnest. Okay, let's blow this up again. Um, the pipe operator. Um, this one is the old pipe operator now. There is a, one in base R as well. Um, but all the tidyverse functions are more well equipped 
at least currently, for using the Magritter version of it. So Stefan Bosch uh, wrote the Magritter package quite some years ago now. It feels like it's been a while, four, four years, five years? Has it been longer than that? What year is it? I don't even know at this point. Um, and, and the idea here is to kind of be able to um, uh, do what I was describing earlier, where you have you have input data and then you feed that into the next row and then you do something with it. Maybe you select a couple of columns. You don't want all the data, you just want some of it. And then you feed that in and you do you do something else. You, you make a change to the data and you add a column based upon those two. You multiply them together or something like that. So it allows you to go from one step to the next step to the next step in a very, very, not necessarily concise, but very readable sort of way. Um, so here you can see, you know, how we might we 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 were arranging empty cars by gear, and then we're taking the first ten rows of that. Um, you can write those two together. This is what I was talking about earlier, where you just put arrange as the input to slice, and you take the first ten rows of that, and it gives you the same exact thing. Um, but the readability comes in. If you're doing doing like you know data analysis like live and you're trying to just understand what the data looks like you 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 i usually write like this where you've got you've got empty cars you feed that into a range again whatever you feed is always the first is always the first argument so it it is the data argument the dot data argument of a range so empty cars becomes a range of by gear and then you're slicing that input so again, it replaces the data, the data argument here, and you take the first 10 rows. So all of these things give you, this gives you the same as this and the same as this, and they're, you know, they're more, more or less equivalent. Sometimes you, you might, uh, you, you might want to write some of these other things for readability purposes in a different way. Sometimes you're, if you're just hacking something together, you might do this or, or, or whatever, but but generally, um, this is how I like to write stuff because it's fairly clear. You know, you do one step, then you do the next step, um, and and <clears throat> all of the tidyverse functions in general are built to to be piped. They're pipeable. Um, so, and that's that's the point of this uh, this little section here. Can I make a quick pause? This is like slightly tangential. I'm just wondering if anybody else has come across this. So I've got right now who I'm trying to teach um, R and tidyverse and all this stuff and she's getting quite confused by when one uses quotes on a column name versus when one doesn't so for example here in a range right we don't need to put any quotations around that whereas when you use the um, I think it's a table function uh, column to row names you always need to put quotes around the column you want and does anybody know is there an easy way to like because I don't have a good answer she's like well why do I have to use quotes here and not yeah. here so like, yeah, um, I remember back when they were, I remember Hadley answering a question on Twitter about this and I, I don't have the link, maybe I'll, I'll look for it later, but Hadley's used to be a prolific tweeter. So I don't think I'll find it, but he said something along the lines of the way you know when you need to quote a variable in these functions. So generally, no, you don't need to, but the way you know you need to is if you're creating something. So if you're creating a new column, Typically you would, so columns to names, you're creating a column, what are you gonna call it? You give it a name. And and that's also true with pivot, pivot wider, pivot longer as well, I believe. Yeah. If you're creating something, you you put the, you can put it in quotes. But what but about mutate? Right. right, so mutate's yeah. one of the exceptions for sure. I was just, yeah, I was thinking the same. Mutate is also one of those things. So I yeah, guess it's not completely have, consistent. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has any ideas. You you have differences between people longer and people wider, because within people longer you do quote eight uh, when you assign a variable. Uh, instead, with people wider, you don't need it. Right. So the because you're consuming is, it, right? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. You consume it. Yeah. I, I didn't think about that, but uh, what? The, the best suggestion I can say is to look at the um, documentation within R. So you do question mark and the function, and then it will tell you um, the syntax for using that specified function. 
because for example, uh, my difficulties are with string detect, I don't know, string, str underscore and then detect. I always, in my mind, I cannot stick on where, where to put uh, the, uh, the pattern and, uh, and the, the string. So uh, anytime I put, uh, so this is my, uh, my case, but I found these difficulties as well. Um, to memorize, um, if, if you use a function very often, obviously you know that we pivot longer, for example, you use quote eight and we pivot wider, you don't use it. And then you stick to that. But if you have a different functions that maybe you use rarely or something, you, you might have difficulties in understanding because there is, there is not a rule, uh, at least for me. I don't see the thing that, uh, I, I didn't know <laughs> that you use quotes when you build in something. So that was interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, it's been a while and obviously mutate is an exception, right? Cause you're creating a new column. I do wonder if like, if you quote in mutate, I think it works. You could try it. Um, let's say empty cars. Um, I don't know, new, so, so you could say new equals uh, disp times MPG, something like that. But maybe we can also say new one equals disp times MPG. So you can quote it in mutate uh, as well. Okay. So I guess that's an easy rule of thumb. Then if we're creating a new column, then we should use quotes. Otherwise, oh yeah, library as well. <laughs> oh yeah, you can yeah you can use library either way when you're loading a package. Is that what you meant, Al? Yeah, yeah. Isabella just made a comment. Like I had a similar oh, question it. about the library and like when you how you can either use, use quotes and there is a reason behind it. Like I remember. It is touched upon in the advanced R book, like when one uses quotes and why you don't have to use quotes sometimes. And as it was kind of a similar thing. I read it and then I was like, mm, yes, this is interesting. And then it like immediately disappeared from my brain. Yeah. Yeah, I think that mutate was a special case because it's a highly used function and they made it flexible so that you could do it either way because people, you know, maybe some people didn't see the reason to name something. Yeah. That way, but it's an inconsistency too. So um, yeah, like maybe it's just that human element where they were trying to be empathetic to the users and just, you know, if you're gonna use this function a lot to create a lot of variables, having it be able to do it either way, uh, be, having it be flexible kind of makes sense to me. Um, are we good? Any, any other questions or, or comments or additions? Maybe I said something wrong please stop me okay functional programming um this one's interesting because like one of the main purposes of per um the per package is to enable iteration over over rows in a, in, a, in, a, in a table, especially when you have complex objects like list, lists or tibbles nested within uh, list columns. So you have tibbles nested within a, within a row. Um, the idea here is that, you know, traditional programming, um, not traditional, but, you know, even modern programming, you know, in C, C and Fortran and other such things, the fastest way to iterate is a for loop. Um, that's still true, um, but there are tools in R and Python to make the, the for loop go away a little bit or be a little bit more hidden behind in the background, um, and but also be a little bit more readable in terms of usability. So, you know, the idea here is that we're going to iterate over the number of rows in empty cars. Uh, here, we're, we're, we're adding uh, a roots uh, variable or sorry, a vector that is of length n and is in a real, so, so a number 
uh, the, the, the number version of NA, not non-integer version of NA. And then we're going to iterate over one to N and take the square root of the mile per gallon times two in, in, in MT cars. Um, and then store that within, within roots. And, and so we get uh, out here. So it looks like this. So we have, well, here's to show what it looks like along the way. Um, so roots in this case is all in A, and then we're going to iterate over over uh, roots and store store the square root of that times two, and we get that vector out. Um, obviously, we can functionalize this. Um, and abstract away some of this like actual functional part here and put in um, and just have abstract that out. So then we can use map to iterate over the same set of data. Um, and just just the first they're just taking the first three rows here and And then you get out you get out a list of that output more or less, or not more or less ac exactly that. Um, there is there is a um, by yeah here's this is really important the map return per pretty much per period. Um, you can force it to return um, uh, in this case a character vector, uh, a numeric vector, or a logical vector. And why don't we just go ahead and do that? Because um, we can run the same thing, and we can say map double. We want it to return. We want it to force the the, the return into uh, into a numeric vector. Uh, we can't. We can mess with this and actually make it return um, something farcical that doesn't make any sense. We can have it return the the character version of those that numeric vector. So it it coerces that into uh, the the thing that you're you're wanting out, um, and this can be really useful um, in 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 some cases where you may have like mixed data types and stuff like that, where you want to parse things in a different way. I've used it uh, to do some to do some stuff like that, so that you get out a character vector, so you're not squashing anything that into an NA that you may not want squashed. Let's go back. So we so we did that and and uh, and and map is used with you know um, one input more or less so you're just iterating over one vector or one vector of what of some object and then map two you can iterate over two objects at once and use that to create um, you know things together with those two variables. So that looks like this. So we're, we're taking uh, miles per gallon, we're taking weight. We're no longer assuming that the weight is two. We're, we're actually taking the weight of the car. Um, oh, I'm sorry, is that the weight of the, no, that's right. Yeah, so, so we're, we're taking the actual weight of the, the vehicle instead of, and, and you could see that the numbers are very different in terms of, in terms of that. Uh, you know, I, I taught a, it's been a while, but I taught a, a, like an introductory course on PER for the Davis R user group out in California when I was out there. And I really, I really like the idea of teaching PMAP first um, because PMAP is the most universal map function in terms of what it, what it can do in terms of how many variables you can put into it. So I, I, uh, I also threw, I threw this out too, because PMAP, you, you feed it a list with your, with your objects that it will iterate over. And this can be as long as you want, more or less. And, and then you feed it the function that you've got and you, you give things instead of dot X or dot Y, it's dot dot one, dot dot two, dot dot three, dot dot four. I've I've shown I've shown some of the R Studio people some of the output scripts that I have that are a bit crazy. Uh, they went up to like dot dot fourteen. <laughs> it was Allison uh, Hill, and <laughs> she was just like, "What the hell are you doing?" 
<laughs> but it works, so I'm okay with it. Uh, but I, I think that this is kind of one of the more PMAP to me is one of the more like universal things. And just like just like map and map map two, all of the all of the types are there too. So we can say we want it to return character. Um, so to me, PMAP is like I almost wish we when we taught this, we didn't start with map. We started with PMAP, and then and then you can go down to the special cases of map two and map um in some ways but i i don't know that's the way i like to think about it um it, pmap isn't actually introduced uh in this in this set of um uh data but but it's um it's a really useful function uh and then here we go tibbles so we'll come back to tibbles i already talked a little bit about the some of the like you know tibbles are i think hadley at one point said that tibbles are opinionated data frames um, and and the opinion comes in to like these things that we'll go through here today. So like a a a, t a data frame, uh, the default options in a data frame will force a non syntactically, you know, an in, a syntactically invalid name into dots. So if we look at this, it puts dots between. It forces this to this uh, period does not work oops you know um but it, it does actually this is a it doesn't store it as the name that you want but it does store it as a data frame so it's not like it doesn't work completely you can actually uh you can actually force this to work by setting check names to false so you get the same output as you would if you created a tibble more or less at least i believe so um, although what I'm not sure about is like, can you refer to this in the same way as you would this? I didn't check. Sometimes, you know, syntactically, it used to be hell with syntax in non, with invalid names. Like it was super difficult. Like LM didn't work with them. I had to put them as in the, in the formula. It, it didn't work. It di didn't used to work. I forget when exactly that changed, but it was, it was really difficult. So sometimes, you know, the, the thing here is that like you know i don't like to usually change the, the 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 header names that much if i can get away with it and uh because i get data sets from all sorts of people and if i can feed them back their information in the original header name they know what that is and so i don't they don't have to they don't have to think about it i don't if i change the variable name though even if it's just dots in between words it doesn't look as good or it can be confusing and so on and so forth. So it's nice to be able to work with tibbles where you can give it all kinds of crazy names. Um, what I'm not sure is if it works with like weird characters like emojis and stuff like that. I know you can do some of that stuff in Julia, but I don't think you can do it in R still. This one's really important. Um, tibbles prevent partial matching of arguments so like in in data frames if you have a column called partial and a tibble called partial if you feed it literally part of the name it will match this and say i'm going to give you one to five so that's what it does so it, it matches it but if you say if in a tibble it does not do that it won't match it if it's not called part it thinks it doesn't exist, which is true because the column part doesn't exist. The column partial does. So it's going to throw an error and return nothing. Um, and that one, that one doesn't, has only bitten me in the butt a few times, but I, st I still think it's, you know, going back to that, that thing where sometimes it's good to be explicit about what you're, what you're asking for and what you're returning is, is really important. Um, this one, this one sometimes I hate and sometimes I like. Um, this one is like where if you have a, a data frame and you access it in this way, where you're pulling out the the vector version of you're subsetting the the data frame into a vector more or less. You can do that, but if you do that with a tibble, it returns a one column tibble. In this case. Um, Sometimes I I know that there, there there are functions that will pu so pull p u l l will will pull out a vector from a tibble, and so instead of accessing it in this way, you might you might feed in. Uh, in fact, we could do that. We could say um, pull 
kibble. Um, what was it called? Partial. And then we get the vector version, just like you would um, uh, um, from uh, from a data frame. So I guess what it does is it 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 takes that away and functionalizes it so that your um, so that you're explicit in what you're doing, I suppose. I, I think that's probably where, where that one comes from. And, and this is the most critical one here uh, in my mind. And I think it's the most applicable to what we're trying to accomplish later in the book. Um, and that is list columns. So as we've talked about a little bit before, a data frame, a data frame can store a list in a column, but it's a little bit kind of convoluted on how to do that compared to Tibbles. It's very easy to just kind of create a list column. Um, what data frame is doing here when you try and get it to embed the list column, is it saying, no, I want to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna expand that out. So it's it's what's interesting is that this is the output of if you created a Tibble with the nested data and then unnested it. So it's this is actually the output of that unnesting, um, which can be, you know, if you want to kind of skip and, and do it, it's, it can be quite useful if, if that's the intention. But um, it, as I said before, and, and as you'll see in the, this book and elsewhere, you know, having nested, nested uh, lists or nested tibbles in a data frame allows you to kind of think very logically about uh, the organization of your data and and how to process it uh, down the line. It also works really, really well with the, the per functions that will allow you to uh, iterate over each of those rows and do something quite complicated. All right. Should I maybe pause for a moment? Anybody have any questions? Did I miss any that? No. Okay. No, but I, I think you've got a good point about. Sorry, you said this a while ago about you teaching PMAP first. Because when I first started learning map, I was really frustrated. Like, like I was like, how do I get my other arguments in here? I have more than one. I have more than two. What do I do? Yeah. Um. Yeah. When when uh, and this was probably the first iteration of the of the r for ds book um like right when it came out um i was I, right after that I, I decided to teach that uh just just a just a, a thing on pretty much the map functions I, I said per but it was just map so it was map p and walk as well so walk is the same is walk is just like map except for you're running it for the output so like um you're you're saving out uh, maybe CSVs of subsets of your data or something like that. And you can iterate over those subsets and save them out. Um, so you're, you're, you're looking for the, I forget what it's called. It's like, you're looking for walk is the out, the output is what you're after. Whereas map just keeps returning the, the output as like a, as a data frame object. So if you're saving out, so walk would be great for saving out CSVs, for saving out ggplots uh, to disk, those sorts of things. Uh, map is good for data manipulations and so on. But like, for for sure, I've, I've I felt for a while that like exactly like you, Al, like how do I get ten things into this function and do something with that? Like like, then they always show you map first, and and you know one of the things I was going to point out too. Um, was around like the the way functions are written. Like there's this there's there's a couple of different ways to do it, where you've got like a function. Um, I don't know if y'all is that is that big enough? You've got a function and you can you can use this like lambda style notation to do it. Uh, here I'm just running a, a linear model with x versus y with the data as dot. So this would be like if I was running it in map, the, the data is called dot. And here I wrote out the same function where you you can feed in x, y, or and a data set, and you you feed that into lm. And I forgot to close my bracket. Um, if it's all in one line, you don't often have you don't always have to use the brackets, but I like to throw them in just to just to secure things. Um, 
that was another thing I was going to mention too, because there's so many, there, there seemed like that was one of the daunting things for me too, uh, when I first started learning per was like the notation, they show you like three different notations from the beginning. And it's, it, it was confusing how, which one to use where and which one, what, what are the downsides uh, of, of it, of each, of each type or each style. Um, I don't know if that made sense, but yeah, PMAP is my friend. Uh, so the next thing is about how to how to read in, you know, relatively complex data sets. Um, in this case, we're going to show like a, almost a complete a complete pipeline, relatively speaking. So we we load the we load the tidyverse functions or, or or sorry yeah tidyverse functions and all the packages that in, that are included. And actually, that's that's a great way to to see which ones are loaded. So you can see I've been screwing around with this a lot. Okay, so there you go. You got ggplot, tibble, tidyr, readr, which is the function that we're talking about here with re read CSV, per dplyr, stringr, and forecats for working with uh, with factors. Um, and one thing, one thing to really you know that's important to point out, and actually it might be pointed out later, but but definitely uh you need to keep in mind when you the order you load things matters in r and so you get functions that are named the same thing in different packages and and whichever one is loaded last is the one that wins uh, unless you're explicit using the double colon notation um so so sometimes you'll see and in fact you see that here in this pipe where there every every function is called uh, relative to its its package name. Um, so anyway, um, we're we're loading we're loading our packages. We have a URL which has a quite sizable CSV actually. I it took quite a, it took a minute to download that thing uh, earlier today, and um, uh, so we you know just just like I said you know this is this is how I like to work too. So you're you're going to save this this object that comes out of here as all stations we're going to read it in um, as i said this takes a minute and then we're going to select um, station name date and rides but we're going to rename station name to station so so we're kind of doing two things at once here there is a there is a rename function as well that will rename that is the same input and uh Here's another example where we're creating a new column called station, but we're not quoting it. I don't know if you can do that here as well, probably. Um, but but effectively, you know, this is a this yeah. is essentially renaming it. Go ahead, Al. Yes, yes, it's or right. you can do it. Yeah, you can do it without quotations and just you 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 do directly without using mutate. You do select and rename the new the, the column that you are selecting with a new name. Yeah. So yeah. so I will say too that um, when you do when you use select, this is all you get out. Uh, you get three columns. You're you're foregoing any any other columns that you've loaded in. Um. So when you use rename, you get you only rename what you're renaming and you get everything back. So if, when you use select, you're, 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 you're narrowing down the number of columns explicitly. Uh, if you wanna get rid of a column, you just put a minus in front of it. So you could say minus, minus date and it would get rid of date, but keep everything else. Um, there is an everything function. So if you wanna reorder just a few things in the beginning, you can say, I want, so back to empty cars, I want MPG displacement, sill, cylinder, sill, and then and then everything. And then it, it will reorder and put those things in front. Um, there is there's a newer function I think that also reorders columns. Yeah, relocate. 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 I I'm so used to select at this point. I don't I haven't changed my habits, but um, but that's the idea. So we've selected a few. We've read in the data. We've selected. Uh, three columns we renamed one we're going to convert the character date field to uh to an actual date and at the same time we're in our mutate call we have two separate things where we're going to create the change the rides 
to uh, per 1,000 rides. So we have 1,000, so we're dividing by 1,000. So here we're, we're using the Lubridate MDY to create, to take date and cur turn it into a date object. So it's going to return a vector of dates that can be put into the, uh, the same column and we're dividing rides by 1,000. Now we've, we've done that, we're going to group by date and station, and then we're going to summarize by taking the maximum number of rides um, and storing that back into rides. So we've replaced rides twice now. Um, the original rides we've 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 divided by a thousand, and we've summarized by taking the maximum number of rides at that station uh, on a given day. And then this last part is um, kind of important. If you um, uh, you'll see the output from summarize if you uh, if you don't specify the dot groups argument it will i think the first time it'll say hey we've kept the the last grouping so you'll see that it will drop station but it will keep date i believe that's the case it's one or the other i'm pretty sure they drop station and keep date um and uh, and and then it will still be grouped by date if you go forward. So that's one thing to be really careful of. of and and you want to be you want to specify the dot groups argument, or you can you can use the ungroup function to get rid of the groups on a table. Yeah, sometimes sometimes you if you do ungroup, even if you do ungroup, he asks you to uh, um, so it, it put a warning saying that uh, there's some variables, they're still grouped. And this happens when you uh, call more than one uh, variable to be grouped. So if you do just group by, by date, so it doesn't uh, put the warning. If you do more than one variable, if you group one more, than, even if you do ungroup, uh, it, it will warn you that there's some variables that are still grouped. It will, but it if you use ungroup, it will ungroup them. So it that that warning comes from the summarize argument, and then and then it goes to ungroup and ungroups it. So the returned object doesn't have groups. That's my experience anyway. But yeah, the warning comes out of summarize. Um, but I'm pretty yeah, I'm pretty sure the that if you use ungroup, there definitely is no groups, which is, is the only thing that function does, in fact. <laughs> so uh, and then they take you know the head of the stations, they take just the top 10 rows of those of the stations, and you can see the number of you know thousands of rides. Uh, so 448 rides were here at the Bronzeville IIT station um, on January 1st, 2001. Um, so, you know, the, the, the real crux of this is that, you know, and I'm sure you all preach into the choir here, but like the, the real crux of this is that the, um, this is extremely readable. Even without the comments, you kind of know what it's doing. Like you're reading it in, you're selecting some columns, you're changing some things. You're gonna group by these things and then you're gonna make a summary. It's like, it's pretty clear cognitively what's happening. It's really pretty easy to understand, even like I said, even even without the comments. I am not always good with the comments, but that's part of the thing. If I create a script or a function or something like that, I like to go back and do exactly this. I don't always label the steps, but I definitely put what I'm trying to accomplish, either above or next to with the comment. Um, but that's that is the. That is the pretty much the end of the tidyverse tour. There's some further reading here that's suggested by the uh, by the previous slides. Uh, the tidyverse design principles is kind of a lot of the stuff that we went over in the beginning. This uh, design of everyday things is the is that door example where it's like it's not obvious what you need to do and you sometimes get it wrong, and that's a bad thing. It should be fixed. Um, and and yeah, so a lot of these a lot of these design principles come from a lot of these other places uh, in in programming, uh, trying to make things more human friendly. And then uh, I guess this video will be embedded into here. Uh, this one that we just did will be embedded here for cohort four.
in, in as soon as I figure out how to use GitHub again. Um, so that's that's it from me today. Um, are there any comments, questions, or further discussion? Back to R. I may have a question. Okay, I don't know if you, any of you have any experience. Uh, when you group it, and then uh, uh, more than one variable, so the, the, the table selects just the variable that you group it and the one that you have created in case you create some. Uh, wh what do you do if you need the rest of the table? Do you do any joints? Or there's, I, uh, I use joints sometimes. I don't know if there's any other option to so, so, add the rest of the table. When you group it, you have a, se a selected number of, of, of variable left. How do you do to add the rest of the table if you need it after you have grouped and summarized creating a new variable, for example? All right, so you've got, um, you'll do like, um, Oh gosh, what would you do? Like group by <laughs> like cylinder and then, and then- I do compute. like group by cylinders and uh, I don't know, another one, uh, another yeah. variable. Say, How about know, gear, something like gear? gear? Yeah, yeah, cause that's repeated a lot. And then summarize, and then, what we want yeah. to summarize, displacement maybe? Yeah. Yeah, maybe the, the, the main. Let's say uh, and name it with a new variable, say with displacement to do uh, this two, for example, or this mean. So you have a new. Oh, you want to call it this mean? Yeah, to have a new variable. So. So that looks like this. Yeah, and then like I, I get what you're saying, Frederick, and then you're saying okay, but now I actually also wanted to have the car name still on there, or something like this. Is this what you're saying? Yeah, but there are multiple, um, there are multiple yeah. cars represented there, right? Yeah, uh, let, let's say that we need to ungroup first, as you said, that you need to uh, dot groups and drop. And then uh, uh, let's say that we want to add the rest of the I table. It, right? um, the rest of the table. Yeah. Oh, you, or, want, to, you want to put the displacement mean back? against this table yeah oh yeah so i would do a join i would take this and, and join, this table yeah. and, and and join it back to so ah. and then i would do a left join maybe back to so mt uh oh <laughs> thing is i have to convert this back right but i see So we're gonna put that in and then we'll do dot and then by equals C, uh, what is it? Sill gear, something like that. So then you have the, the average displacement for that group of cars cast, you know, put against the rest of the table. But I don't think you have to do a summarized yeah. call here. That's what I would usually do. So you can just add how. So uh, basically, what? rather than what? using a ah, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so rather than using a summarize call, you can actually just do the group by and then mutate, and then that will add this new thing back onto the original table. So I put it in the chat there. Yeah. I okay. See it. Yeah. yeah. So it's so the same. And then you call like ungroup afterwards. Mm -hmm. if, if you no longer want ungroup, of course. Okay. Yeah, I was answering someone's question the other day, I think on the Slack and I, uh, I was nesting and unnesting. And they were just like, why don't you just do a group line <laughs> summarize? And I was like, oh, 
I mean, it's the same thing kind of in the end, but it's yeah. uh, it's a lot more convoluted to do it, the mm. nest, unnest, and all those mm. such things. But yeah, this is a similar sort of thing where it's like you, this is a much more simple way to do it. Yeah, this is also the funny thing with my trainee now, like she'll ask me how to do something. I'm like, well, we could do it this way or this way, or maybe this way, or I guess we could do it this way. And then like her face goes blank. I'm like, I need to stop. I'm gonna, we're gonna do it this way. <laughs> Well, I felt I felt the same about the 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 way you you uh, you can you can actually assign a function within per within the per functions like it's like you can use the lambda version or you can use the anonymous function or you can there was one other way I swear but I can't remember what it is right now and it was just like that's confusing <laughs> so but you have to start somewhere Al. I don't I don't I don't know what the solution is of course but. but well, sometimes you have the formula thing. You have formula equals, and then you are the lambda, the lambda uh, way to do the thing. Otherwise, uh, you use the function. Uh, so this the second way to do it. I've seen Tan do some crazy stuff with it on uh, on the Slack, though. So. Like he uses the lambda and puts a pipe in the lambda, and it's like I didn't even know you could do that. <laughs> I swear, at one point you couldn't do that, and it would break if you had a pipe in the lambda call, in the in the tilde, after the tilde, it wouldn't work. But I guess it works now. This is the problem with being an early adopter and trying to keep up along the way. There's been so many changes. Are we good? Yeah, that was like, looks like Thanks, looks like Isabella is got to go too. And thanks everyone. Uh, seems Thank like a good you. group. I hope looking forward to next time in three weeks, two weeks. Next year. Yeah. <laughs> well, happy, <laughs> happy New Year, everyone. Um, happy New Year. Have a nice Christmas. Ciao. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye.